All right, quick lesson on the word Pentecost. Are you ready? Pentecost comes from the Greek word for 50, which is the way the Septuagint, which comes from the word 70, translates the Jewish festival of Shavuot, which means weeks in Hebrew, which happens 50 days after Passover and was originally a festival for the early wheat harvest in Israel. Pentecost then came to also be the commemoration of God giving the law, the Torah, to Moses on Mount Sinai. In Christian circles, Pentecost is also the day that the Holy Spirit came down in wind and flame upon the early followers of Jesus, allowing them to speak in the languages of people from all over the Greco-Roman world. Got it? Perfectly clear? Okay. Yeah. Or you could do what Solomia and I did at the 9 o'clock service this morning, which was simply to sing Happy Birthday Church. It's, today is the birthday of the church. And there are so many amazing details in this story in Acts, but the language has got to be one of the coolest, right? That all of a sudden, all of these disciples spoke in other tongues. And when the scripture says, are these people not all Gal Galilean? Galileans? It's kind of like saying, aren't these all folks who are hicks from the country? Because Galileans was not particularly a compliment in those days. And I think it must have sounded a little bit like this this morning. Really cool and a little unnerving. A little, all little, at once. little creepy there, yeah. Right. Speaking in other languages miraculously is is an amazing, amazing thing. But it's worth noting that even communicating in the same language can be challenging. Uh, we just moved down a year and a half ago from Vermont. And while we were there, we learned a lot over 34 years in what is allegedly English up there, too. <laughs> in Vermont, we learned that kale has two syllables. That's right. And that heading up to Hadwick Way just meant that you were going to Hardwick. And that the phrase, maple creamy, describes one of life's most delicious experiences. I remember when I was in seminary here at Boston University, and I was working as a home health physical therapist to make ends meet. And I remember visiting a patient whose home was in Charlestown, and his wife asked me if I would like a tonic when I came in. And a little appalled, I said, no, ma'am, not while I'm working. Because I'm from the Midwest, and I thought she was offering me a gin and tonic. When I realized which one she wanted to offer me was, in fact, a cold carbonated beverage, I said, oh, you mean pop. Right? That's what we call it where I'm from. It's all English, but it's not always easy to communicate. It's the speaking in tongues that gets most of the attention at Pentecost. Uh, though the flames are really cool as well. Um, now there are some traditions in the Christian family, uh, including one that Adam comes from, uh, that place a high value on speaking in ecstatic tongues as a sign of one's faith, uh, of being blessed by the Holy Spirit. But you can imagine the, the troubles this sets up, the the, the hierarchies that happen within a church based on your being able to speak in tongues or not, and how this can be misused as a test of one's spiritual worthiness. In fact, it happened in the very first years of the church, and the Apostle Paul, in his writings, had to address it. Uh, in his first letter to the church at Corinth, he recognizes that speaking in tongues is a spiritual gift, and one that he lists in the listing of spiritual gifts. He puts it dead last on purpose because he knew how much trouble it was causing at Corinth. And right after he mentions that spiritual gift, he writes, let me show you a more excellent way and begins to write about love in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. Well, and it begins, I may speak in human tongues and the tongues of angels, but if I have, do not have love, I have nothing. Yeah. Right? That's his corrective. 
Because speaking in tongues isn't the point. Love is the point. God's love for us and our love for God and our love for each other. Falling in love with God and essentially falling in love with each other as equals, as co-beloveds, as partners in God's world. That's the point. Willie James Jennings, who is a professor of systematic theology in Africana uh, studies at Yale Divinity School, writes this about Pentecost. Through the Holy Spirit, the followers of Jesus at Pentecost are now connected in a way that joins them to people in the most intimate space of voice, memory, sound, body, land, and place. It's language that runs through all these matters. To speak a language is to speak a people. And then Jennings goes on to say, God speaks people fluently. And God's want, God wants Christ's disciples to speak people fluently too. And that means we, in the 21st century, also have to ask, how do we speak people fluently? What language shall we borrow that does this? What exactly is the language of God's love? Well, at first I would suggest that speaking the language of God's love isn't about speaking at all. The first step of speaking people fluently is listening. Listening to other people's experience, to their hopes and fears, their needs and gifts. Anabaptist pastor David Augsburg says, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person they are almost indistinguishable. It is such a gift giving someone our full attention, really listening and being with them, really seeking to understand them, lets them know we love them, and God does too. Steve Garnis Holmes, we're gonna bring him up again, says it's not so much speaking in tongues as listening in tongues. And listening is really hard. If only because we're distractible and our world is full of distractions. And it's really hard to listen to someone that I don't agree with. I mean, forget politics. It's hard to listen closely to someone who wants to go to a different movie than I want to go to. Wait. <laughs> You're talking about me? And as Jennings says, there's a startling intimacy to really listening to people. It enters into that person's space of voice and memory of sounds and body and land and place. This is part of the call to Pentecost, to listen to people so intently that they know we love them no matter how different we may seem to be. And then, when we've listened long and hard enough, when it comes our time to speak, Pentecost asks us to consider, how do we speak so that this person hears love in a way that they've never been able to before? I'm going to say that again. How do we speak people so fluently that people hear love in a way they've not been able to hear love before? This is hard. This almost always requires us to stretch, to try unfamiliar ways to connect with folk, especially folk who are really different from us in some ways, even if you're married to them. Finding 
that language to speak love to someone so that they really hear it and really hear you requires us to get ourselves out of the center and instead put their lives at the center. So for me to speak the language of God to a person in front of me, intimately enough that they hear God's love for them, what examples do I share that might make sense for them? And it might not be the examples that make sense for me. What stories do I tell that will resonate with their experience rather than what I want to show up? What are the words that make a bridge, that make a connection across the space between us? Last Thursday, we attended Harvard's commencement exercises, and it was all the pomp and circumstance that you can imagine. Nobody does it like Harvard. Um, maybe the King of England. <laughs> the graduate school speaker was Vic Hogg, a queer, non-binary member of the Natawasepi Huron Band of the Potawatomi tribe in rural Michigan. So Hogg came to Harvard after earning a bachelor's degree at Yale in psychology and working for a nonprofit for a while, and came to the Kennedy School to study Native American and public service in that context, and to pursue a master's degree with a focus on tribal governance and sovereignty. Hogg, who uses they, them pronouns, talked about how they came with big dreams that ran smack into the reality of the nitty-gritty day-to-day -day details of being a student on the Harvard campus. And you could hear everyone in the crowd chuckle because they could relate. Then Hogg described a tragedy. Just five months ago, when they were home in Michigan, they were shot during a carjacking and have since been through an arduous rehabilitation process. And with the help of family and friends and a fierce determination, they relearned how to walk and return to their studies, and they graduated last week. I do not stand here alone, they said. Countless friends, family, and strangers have shown up for me in these last five months. Then Hogg quoted poet Gwendolyn Brooks. We are each other's harvest. We are each other's business. We are each other's magnitude and bond. And I wrote that down because that is the message of Pentecost. When the Holy Spirit spoke through those disciples in languages everyone could understand, the Holy Spirit was saying, we are each other's harvest. We are each one of us part of what God has planted in the world, part of what God has designed to blossom and to ripen. Everyone, in all our similarities and in all of our differences, everyone is a celebration of God's love. The festival of Pentecost began as a harvest festival yes. and became a celebration of flame and fire and spirit. So church, nearly 2,000 years later, how will we live this out? How will we recognize that we are each other's harvest, that we are each other's beloveds, united by fire and flame? How will we listen to one another so carefully, so clearly, that when we speak, 
we will be given ways to communicate that will nurture each other's growth into a full and rich harvest. How will we allow the Holy Spirit to communicate through us, to work through us, to love through us so clearly that others will hear love in ways they never thought possible? And how will we hear that love in our own hearts, too? On this Pentecon, excuse me, on this Pentecost Sunday, friends, be very sure of this. We are, each of us, God's harvest of love. And we are each other's harvest, too, And the Holy Spirit, with all her power and flame and glory, and also near to us as our very breath, the Holy Spirit always delights to draw us closer in wholeness and in justice and in love.